All right, off you go. Um, so last week we used data from um, the USDA, on data, which was really exciting data, where we each got given a food to pull the USDA website. Uh, I had waffles, so I paid the data to pull. You what? I don't know if someone's on the things of breath, but uh, yeah, so I had 15 pages of data to pull from the USDA website. And to do this, we had to build a macro. Um, yeah, this is my macro. So this is the uh, original. Um, this is, well, this is the first page. Obviously, like I had a separate page that feeds into this with 15 URLs on it. And that then feeds in, it then passes um, various different bits of the XML that's pulled from that web page. Um, so I think the top line, I haven't actually run this for a while, is, oh, that was, that was the ingredients. Um, you can see down here, that's the manufacturer of the product. I'm assuming that's product name. Um, and these are the individual values within there. And we then reunioned all these back together, um, which gave me, after a certain amount of hours, a file to to actually look at and come up with some sort of viz from. Um, so yeah, in terms of the viz itself, this is what I've ended up. Um, it's really really basic because I just couldn't think of how else to show. All the content off for all the waffles. So I had about 300 different waffle products um, using the search term waffle. And I thought, how can I compare them all against each other? So when you start Googling around about food, it quickly becomes pretty obvious that the three main key points that manufacturers are advised to put on their packaging um, are to do with fat, sugars, and sodium or salt. And um, so, yeah, I just I've literally just lined them up next to each other as a kind of percent of total. Um, looking at obviously using the, the color scheme from USDA, but looking at in terms of like high, medium, low, um, obviously like low being ideal, high being not so ideal. And this being America, you can see that high and medium um, seem to take up a majority of the space on each of the charts. But yeah, I mean, if you, if you hover over, you get an idea of uh, where things lie. Um, Obviously, like they show up on the other charts, and um, I, th I think it would have been quite nice to add in sort of tool tips, the information from the other two charts, but I couldn't work out how to do that um, on short notice, um, and so I've just gone for a highlight feature where if you go over them, you can see um, similar name products um, popping up. Um, it's quite interesting. Like, it seems like if they've got, if one's got high fat, it's got low sugar sodium, and you know the inverse is true. So if it's kind of got high sodium, it's got low fat. Um, I'm not sure if that's a taste um, element, taste thing. But yeah, it's, it's kind of what I came up with. Like, you know, I'm a bit rusty coming back in for America, a bit jet lagged, but um, I'm glad that was something out from day four. I got a couple of questions for you, Alex. Um... So does where something is on the zero to 100% scale matter or, or is it, or does that really mean yeah. percent of total products? Is that just adding up the number? So for example, when you hover over that one there at the top, does that mean it has a hundred percent sugar? No. So if you, if you see here, uh, it's got the highest, it's got the highest level of fat, a uh, hundred milligrams. And, uh, the difference in color is the kind of rating that's given, uh, I think it's called GDA rating. Okay, so, so all the blues are actually kind of together, right? Like they're um, so then, so basically uh, about twenty five percent of the products are have high fat content. That's what that means. That's right? correct. Okay, that's correct. yeah, because I think it's a bit confusing because it looks like it's low in sodium content, even though it's actually medium in sodium content. Does that make sense? Kind of how I'm reading it. Uh, I mean, this one's coming out as high, high in fat, high in sugar, medium yeah. in sodium. I, I guess I'm saying that because it, it kind of moves within that orange band on the right hand side, or or the blue band on the right hand side. So it makes it look like some products are higher than others because they're stacked on top of each other. Um, I was really yeah, surprised. I, mean, they, you, I was surprised you didn't do a waffle chart. 
Because <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> that one there on the left hand side is per 100 milligrams, right? And what's the is the middle per or all of them per 100 milligrams? Yeah, we just we just like tip per 100. Yeah, yeah. So you could have um, you could have made used a, a waffle chart that was like 10 by 10, and just let people pick okay. one one product at a time or something. And that would have sh what? So it fill, it would fill up, would it? I mean, but the thing was, I kind of went macro view as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, I get it. Yeah. You can see that the like, sodium is very high, um, you know, and you can just kind of take get an idea that there's not many low fat, low sugar, low sodium kind of products, um, as well as having the micro view where you can cover um, and see where products lay across the board. Yep. Cool. Good stuff. Well cool. done. Thank you. And who's next? Okay. And who is Algo? It, it's AJ. Okay. I give you control. It's thunderstorming here. I'm um, handy. Um, so for today's tip, I've kind of done. Uh, I guess for the for, for the rest of the audience, um, what uh, everybody else is going to be presenting about is stuff they learned with Tableau Server this week. Yeah, yeah. Just like Andy said, we're talking about servers. Um, I've kind of talked about data extracts and how you can keep your data up to date in server. So obviously, if you're going to be working in server, you want the up to date data at all times. Uh, and then there are three main ways you can do it. Uh, first one is you can schedule uh, data extracts, and I can show you how you do that. Uh, so if you go to your project schedules, and you can just add a new schedule, it's quite simple. Um, the second way you can do it is uh, if you're about to publish your workbook, you can do it in your des uh, Tableau desktop. Just go to your server, publish workbook, and you can select when you want to refresh your uh, data extract. So depending on what kind of data it is, you can update it um, either hourly. Yeah. yeah those, hourly. those schedules that you see in that list are actually what you create on the server in the first place, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So yeah. So these are all the ones that were created in the data school. Yeah. Uh, and the third one, you can also do it in uh, it's the first one. Yeah, I didn't realize this, but you can also do it using um, tab command as well. So I can't really show you, but like, yeah, essentially, if you just do tab command to refresh extracts, you can do that that way as well if you are going to do it in that view. And the second tip that I want to give is like, if you do have failed extracts, um, Tableau Server has a thing where you can um, uh, alert the, uh, the server admin that there is a problem. So as long as you're admin, you can indicate this problem. Um, you can also um, select uh, email notification. So if you have like, ongoing problems, you get an email. And the third one is that uh, if there is a schedule refresh that fails five times in a row, then it will stop doing it for any further times. So it just completely stops. So until someone goes in and kind of fixes the problem, uh, it won't run any scheduled uh, data refreshes. And yeah, that's my tip. Server tip so of the week. I've got a question for you about the the um, when something fails five times in a row. Is t this do you do you have to manually configure Tableau Server to then suspend f any further refreshes, or does that come kind of by default? It's by default. Okay, so good. that's pretty cool. Like, I think it's because uh, that wasn't. Uh, I think that's a relatively new thing. I don't remember that being there before a couple of years ago, at least. Yeah, if you fail to times, so someone would have to like so the server admin uh, would have to go in and find out what the problem is. And then they be like, yeah, until they uh, until they fix the problem, you won't start the schedule won't start again. Cool. And yeah. um, um, with some of the email notifications and and some of the tab command stuff, um, Mike Roberts on his blog has a lot of uh, really cool um, tab command kind of things you can do as well. So if if anybody's looking for additional resources, check out Mike Roberts' blog. I think there's a question. Cool. cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. The, the the server comes with with three preset schedules by default when you install it, and then you can kind of customize them from there. Yeah. Cool. Good job. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Who's next? We'll just go around, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll go next, Andy. Will. 
Will I am? Yes, indeed. You guys, yeah. You guys see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I decided to do a uh, so a series of tips linked to um, hardening your server. So increasing the, the level of, of security of your server. And the main reason for that is that I was actually pretty impressed by how easy it was yesterday. I thought that taking care of server security would be a really, really complicated topic. Uh, but JMAC just showed us a few of the tab admin commands you can use to really easily just, just refresh some of the, the encryption keys in, in your server and just kind of protect it. So in case um, it was just, it's just kind of designed for someone who wouldn't have that much server knowledge, but would you know be tasked with, with kind of uh, administrating one and who would just you know arrive at a server and, and could use this guy to sort of run a few commands really quickly and just make sure that that everything is, is safe and ready to go um, so I'm just going to bring you through the, the blog post itself uh, just to show you what the majority of these um, tips are so I in the blog post I kind of explained that to do this you're going to need to use tab admin commands and so we pretty much learned yesterday that using them is, is quite easy all you need to do is start up command prompt uh, so you're just going to right click on here and, and hit command prompt. And I'll bring you to this window. And then uh, to access the tab admin commands, you need to move a specific folder uh, within your so within your computer, uh, which is the Tableau server and then bin. So you can just use this command and it will automatically bring you right there. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't actually have server installed on my machine. So right now I've just hit enter, but it's a, I, I don't have it, so I can't show you any commands. But pretty much all you have to do is this, and that's it. You're set. You can start using the command straight away. So, so they would remote into the server first, and then and then start that up, right? Um, remote control into the server, and then they could run that command. Yeah, exactly. That, that's okay. exactly right. So then, uh, so there's a we we did learn about um, just changing the environment variables, so you could hide the file path directly. Uh, so that no matter, so you didn't have to do this extra step of, of putting yourself in the right directory, but just for the set sake of not making it too complicated, I just added this little tip. So if you just use this command, it will put you in that directory straight away. Um, so then second step is kind of understanding how these tab admin um, settings work. And so pretty much all the steps we're going to do are going to follow the same structure. So the first, you're going to stop your server. You're then going to use the set command followed by so the command you're actually doing. So that's going to sort of pre-configure the, the changes you're going to make to the settings on your server. You then just hit tab admin configure. That'll push all the changes through, and then you restart your server. So you're just going to do these four steps every time, and the only thing you're going to change is the this sum command part. Um, and so yeah, so now getting into the actual uh, tips themselves. So all of them I found from this uh, security hardening checklist. So it's the one we went through with, with JMAG yesterday. It has 15 different items. And I picked out the one that he made us do, which are really the simplest one, where you're least likely to break anything and where you don't really have to worry all that much about what you're doing. Uh, so you can just run these, and you're pretty sure that it'll just increase the security without breaking anything. Um, and so yes, yeah, so the first one is disabling older versions of TLS, which is a, a method for authenticating and encrypting connections between your server and external clients. So external clients are things like browsers. So if you have a really old browser uh, that uses a just older uh, encryption method, they have been known to, to be hackable. And so they just recommend that you turn them off. So you just put these four lines. It'll turn off um, older sort of encryption methods so that then your server will only interact with browsers that use more modern encryption methods. Uh, so the second tip is quite similar. It's disabling this thing called triple DS cipher suite. So this is also uh, just it's a set of messages used to secure networking connections. So once again, this one's been known to be hackable, so that'll just disable it. Third one is generating fresh asset keys. So asset keys are um, so whenever your um, Tableau server accesses a data source, all the credentials to access them are embedded within those data sources. And the encryption uh, uses something called asset keys. Um, and so if someone gains access to your asset keys and then they have access to your server, they could decrypt all these credentials and access all your data sources. And so if I just generating fresh ones in case someone had the old asset keys, well, they couldn't use them anymore. So once again, just an easy step to make sure that if somebody had previous access and was stealing your data that they couldn't do it anymore. Uh, regenerating internal security tokens, again, uh, quite similar. 
So a lot of the components within the server, they use uh, tokens to communicate with one another and to authenticate that communication. And so if you um, do so one for passwords and one for certificates, you're just regenerating those security tokens. So once again, if someone had previous access, uh, this would kind of not allow them to um, to sort of use the different components to communicate internally. Fifth one is disabling services you're not using. So all the services um, that people can access so externally, so like the API or the single JMX. Uh, so if you're not using them, it's best to just turn them off because it reduces uh, the sort of attack surface of your server. So people can try and access through that or to hack you through that. And the last one is enabling HTTP strict transport security. Uh, so uh, your browser, when it connects to a website or to the server, it uses a protocol called HTTP. HTTPS is just a secure version of it. Um, and so, yeah, so by just turning it on, you're making sure that every time a connection is set up, it'll use this more secure version. And so, yeah, that's pretty much, it was really dry. I'm really sorry, everyone. Uh, this wasn't the coolest thing to present, but it's just, yeah, for someone who's, you know, has to take care of service security, it's just a simplified guide of what we went through yesterday with JMAC um, and one that uses tab admin commands. So, cool, very good. Pretty much it. Nice job, nice documentation there. Well done. Okay, I'm next, Andy, so that's Jamie. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> There's only one person with that accent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've got two different tips. My first one's to do with tab commands. We all had problems with creating users yesterday, which should have been quite a simple set with creating users on our server. And the problem with it is that you had to access a CSV. So as you can see, I've highlighted here what the tab command is. So tab command, create users, then you access a CSV on the computer. But the problem with it is that the guide here on the CSV page and create wasn't clear at all on how to distinguish roles between people. So this bit here that says site role, it says in the column, you can de determine someone's role. So you can put in site administrator, publisher, interactor, or viewer, which isn't the case. Because when you go further down the document here, administrator levels actually when you decide if someone's a site administrator and whether someone's a publisher or not, as you can see, is, an, is another column further down here where it says publisher permissions, just now false. So what I'm doing in my article is I've created a CSV of what it should actually look like, which is a lot easier than this guide here, which doesn't actually show you a CSV file of how it should look like. So when you actually create the CSV, it should have you know, should have these seven columns, and I've, I've put titles above them. These are not needed when you actually put it through the tab command, but it clearly states what needs to be in each column. So in my blog that I'm currently writing, it's going to say you have to remove these titles from the top row, but this is the order you put it in. So Mina is actually this is actually a publisher, and as you can see here, at administrator level, I had to put no. She's sorry, she's the site administrator. So administrator level, I had to put site here. The actual site role originally put interactor, which, as I said, if you read on the site documentation here, you think you'd have to put it as a site administrator here. So it was very confusing. Like three or four of us got stuck on this stage for about ten or fifteen minutes, just because it wasn't clearly worded and there wasn't an example here. So I think this will be really useful to people with. Uh, actually trying to do this create users so that's my first tip just to speed up the process of creating users when you're on tap so, command so you're, you're basically going to publish it almost like a template then right for people to use yeah I'm gonna publish a template yeah and say cool cool good idea template and then obviously delete that top top row really and it should work cool. and then second one was just in relation to tab admin cleanup like obviously a big problem on the server is a lot of people use it and it creates loads and loads of temporary files so JMAX says one of the first things he does when he goes into clients is he makes sure they run a cleanup once a week. So like obviously do it on a Sunday night when no one's using it. He said like Sunday, like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. when it's unlikely anyone's using it. And what a cleanup does, as it states below here, it, it removes all log files. It removes all temporary files. And there's a big difference between having your server running and server not. If your server's not run, if your server's not running, as you can see here, no, no rows of the HTTP of the post SQL, Postgres SQL database is removed, and this is very important because the Postgres SQL database contains every single action someone has with a dashboard. And when you're trying to fix a problem, and you go to you go to help, you have to send them the PostSQL database. So it's very important that you stop the server because if you if you don't stop the server, and that gets deleted when someone's trying to help you, and they say, "Oh, can we please have the PostSQL database?" So we can see the logs. 
and you say no we haven't got it it'll cause obviously it to go for about like a lot longer than what it should like something that should be a five minute time could take for to, could take a while someone has to physically go to the dashboard work with to solve the problem but yeah that's my main two tips which i picked up from the week of with jay mackers as i said we only went through a lot of beginner things and i thought they were two very useful tips that can help out a lot of people when setting up setting up and creating servers through tab command and tab admin yeah very cool good great tips there Andy, I'm following on from that because mine follows directly from his first point. Who's next? Me, Mina. Mina, okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you. So, as Jamie mentioned, the um, tab command for creating users isn't quite clear. Uh, so you have to have all of these different columns that essentially decide uh, different elements of it and, and you know username and password is fine but when it comes to the actual site role there are essentially three columns that decide what uh, role you are so you have to basically put like interactor or viewer which are the only two acceptable in this role whether they're an admin and if so if they're a site or server and then whether they have publisher rights and the combination of these three fields end up deciding what the role is assigned to on server. So I've kind of just put in yellow here, like the first one would be considered an interactor, that's uh, the second one a publisher, and the third a site admin, just dependent on those three columns put together. So it kind of does this calculation of does it fit these criteria to become this role. Um, but that's not actually my main tip. I just wanted to clarify that's what I'm using. So. What I was focusing on is just creating an Alteryx flow, like a, to make an app for it, that you could just have on your desktop and you could click and it would basically generate that CSV and then also run the script to push that up to server. So you would never have to go on the server. You could just click an application. So if I were to run it, it doesn't quite work right now, but I would do this. I could choose my site. I could choose the role that I want the person to have. I would enter their username and their display name and their password and it would then create a new user for me. Um, with the local authentication, not the uh, Active Directory, of course. So that was the first purpose of it. But the kind of second purpose, which I wouldn't be able to do right now, is that if a company wanted to generate users based on them paying for access, is that you could kind of automate that where they pay and then they get given some sort of access and you could tie that in and, and have this tab command linked with it. So I'd replace basically all of these interface tools with actual just um, inputs from somewhere on the internet. Uh, the credentials and then it would just automatically you know put these users online they stop paying for a service that would be the hope anyways but for now it's just an app that's really that cool. will... good idea people yeah the people that have both alteryx and tableau will find that very useful yeah people who already have alteryx obviously you would never buy alteryx for just this purpose but you know if you already have it why not incorporate it yeah exactly cool. yep cool Yeah, Andy, it will be um, me next. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, the tip I wanted to share today was uh, more of a tip around improving efficiency um, within uh, Tableau Server. Uh, especially when it comes to setting up new new users um, for each project. Um, my blog is in the process at the moment, but I do have access to a server, so I'm sort of going to quickly run you through sort of the tips I was going to do. Um, so tip number one will be sort of setting up your groups uh, from the beginning, uh, based on sort of what kind of access that person or those group of people are going to have. <clears throat> so for example, if you've got your site admins, uh, within this page here, you can sort of add in your users and in immediately assign what actions they'll have or what role they'll have within the website. So a problem I used to keep doing when I first started using server was I would actually go in and do each person individually, one by one, 
which is not the best use of my time. Um, but fortunately, J Max sort of spotted that and gave me a tip of sort of setting up your groups in the beginning and assigning them a role. Or so if you, you'll have like one group for your site admins, one group for people who will just publish to the server, another one for people who just interact, and maybe another one for all the project admins. So tip number one um, is just setting up your groups from the beginning and assigning. So so Marcus, you yeah. basically are, uh, you're creating groups and assigning the permissions at the group level. And then as soon as you add people into those groups, they automatically inherit those permissions. Is that right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then, yeah. And so which also moves on to the next tip. So I'm doing sort of two in one with this one today. Um, so once you've got your group set up um, and you want to start creating your projects, um, using this default project here, you can also set the permissions that when you create a new project, immediately permissions will be assigned to a group for, the, for that project. So uh, I'll just pop this open so we can sort of see in adding our site admins. And what we have here is in our default. So this default sort of uh, rolls over into any new projects you create. So based on the settings that you provide in here, you can assign who can do what. So for example, our site admins, if I want them to just be able to view, uh, download, filter, download data, add in data sources. And saving it. So we can see they've all been assigned here. When we come in to create a new project, Again, rather than having to go through each person one by one, we can do it all in one by when you go into edit our position uh, permissions, you can see that it's already carried over all of the predefined settings that I've put in place for that group. So site admins, any new projects you create, site admins can be automatically assigned a role within that within that project. And doing it this way saves you a lot of time because what I was doing was going through each person individually and assigning them uh, permissions. But yeah, j -Mail pointed it out. There's much bigger way, which is what I'm showing you today. And yeah, so if there's a project that they're not supposed to be in, it's just as simple as clicking here, deleting the group, and those that group no longer has access. So rather than having to go through one by one, you just do it all in one. And yeah, that's pretty much uh, Yes, yeah, so that goes back to, to the it goes back to your use case for for creating the groups first thing because you can then assign projects, uh, you can assign groups to projects and and uh, that way you don't have to go to the individual people. Cool. Exactly. So you can do it for each each site you might have, and yeah, so within those sites that those individual groups will have their permissions. So Marcus, someone online has asked, how does it work if you leave a box blank versus a red cross? Ooh. Well, so I know. If, I haven't tried to do the red cross. I think if you leave it blank, it's an outright rejection. Whereas if you put the red, no, if you put the red cross, it's an outright rejection. So the, the red cross is an explicit deny and the blank is an implicit deny. Okay. Yeah, which means basically that if you, um, if you explicitly deny, they will never have access. If you implicitly deny, aka the blank, in one place and you give them permission somewhere else with the green tick, they will actually have access. So that's just uh, an implicit deny versus an explicit deny. Okay. So does that mean you could override permissions at the user level then that the group has if you leave it as an unchecked box? Yeah. Whereas if it's a red tick at the site admin level and then let's say you go in and you edit a site admin, you can't change anything that's a red X? Is that Am I understanding that right? Well, site admins can't have, you can't make them not access anything. Site admins well, can see yeah, it. Call it whoever. Yeah, call it the finance team. doesn't matter. So you set <laughs> permissions at the finance team level, and we and then Mina is part of that finance team, and there's a red X in one of the boxes for the finance team. Does that mean that you cannot change that red X for Mina specifically? But if it's blank, you could either deny or allow at the Mina level then, at the user level? 
I'm not sure. I'm, I'm asking. I'm not sure. Okay, we can find out, and then Mark. I will add it to my blog. That in your blog post. Yeah, that's what I'm going to add it to my blog too. Okay, cool. Good question. Thank you, whoever MS is. Uh, okay, it's me next, Andy. All right, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about user filters in server, uh, specifically a method that JMac taught us yesterday, whereby you're using an Excel file to manage the users and what they can see. So uh, I'm comparing this to the Superstore data, um, whereby someone may be in a particular segment and cover a specific region. Uh, so let's take a step back. Um, yeah. So if we look at the data for Superstore. So Lee, uh, Lee, I'm, Lee, I'm sorry to interrupt. So the use case here is those are almost salespeople and you only want them seeing kind of their the areas they do sales in. Yeah, that's correct. So okay. it's only they can see things are associated with those dimensions, so their segment and their region. Yeah, so I mean, looking at the data here, those are two separate dimensions. Um, but the great thing about doing it in this CSV file is that you can combine two together uh, so that you could build the filtered table that they see by those dimensions. Uh, also, what you can you can have uh, multiple users within that sort of specific case. Um, notice that they are sort of in the same cell and there's just sort of a comma between them. The reason for doing this instead of uh, creating a new line each time is so that there's no duplication in the data when you join. So what you'll go ahead and do is sort of save this file, um, uh, close it, definitely close it. Uh, <laughs> I've had a lot of trouble today where I wasn't closing it actually. Just don't save. Uh, yeah, I don't save. Don't save. <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so what you can do then is take that and join it. You want to do a left join and create a calculated join. So it'll be segment um, plus delimiter and then region. Press OK. Uh, match that to the segment region column, and that's where they should match. Great use case for using that functionality in the um, join options as well. Yeah, the, the uh, in the the cal join calculation feature. Great. Covering that in the lesson. <laughs> so now you'll notice that when there is an instance uh, for a username under that sort of line, you'll you'll see them appear. So if you go forward and then go to a sheet. Um, and create a calculated field. Oh, yeah, sorry, a calculation contains username and then username again, um, and apply this as a filter where this is true. You can then look at the different users and they will only be able to see the data associated with them. So, so to see that list of users on the bottom right that you're that you're clicking on there, you had to sign into your server, and then it automatically shows up, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I'm signed. I'm signed in as a server admin as well, so I think right. that's what allows me to switch between these. Cool. So yeah, I'm signed in and can do that. Um, so if you publish this to server now with it in the filters marks card, this wouldn't be the most secure way of doing this. So just as an additional tip, if we look at these when published, uh, if I go here. This is it published um, with it in the marks card. So if you know the user has still the ability to edit, all they can do is simply go in and remove that from the marks card, and they now have access to all of that data. So the way to do uh, the way to be more secure whilst doing this is actually to apply it to the um, source data itself. So by editing data source filters adding the calculated field here um, and applying it in that way. When you look at it published online, uh, so in this instance, this is where it's been published with it 
in the source data. Now, if someone edits it, there, there's no way that they can access the other information. So it's just a more secure way of doing it. But yeah, that, that about covers it, really. Yeah, that's a that's a great use case, and uh, really like the uh, showing you know the the, um, the 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 pitfalls of just sticking it on the filter shelf. So using the data source filters to make it happen first, that's really good. Good tip. Thanks. Hi, Andy. It will be me now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so for my tips, I've decided to do a blog and um, just incorporate a few tips as I go along. I wanted to focus on um, the permissions and um, the roles assigned in the, in the server. Uh, so initially, I started off by covering all the different tabs uh, in the server menu and uh, focus on adding users. So when, uh, when an admin would uh, add the users, they would immediately need to assign uh, permissions to them, uh, uh, just to assign roles, roles to them, because users are, are assigned roles while uh, content will be assigned permissions. So this would be in uh, this tab over here that you would be able to add users and then assign the permissions. Uh, if we go back to the content that I just had opened, in uh, the content tab, I have a workbook over here to which I will be assigning permissions. And this is just an overview of the content tab that has um, the different project levels, workbooks, and the data sources published, which you can uh, individually assign permissions and um, to manage them additionally. So here you have uh, the server administrator um, role and um, the site administrator role, which are very, very similar. So I'm uh, covering the differences here between the different roles. And then we come to the permissions part. Uh, so for the permissions, the best way uh, to go about is uh, to use this uh, green tick, tick box because it will simply have uh, every different type of activity that the, the user can do. Uh, and you can go and, and assign uh, their permissions on the top level from here, on this tab. This will be a default permission that will just populate these green fields automatically. Or if we want to modify the permission uh, to look uh, differently, like for example, I would want my viewer to also be able to utilize the filters within the workbook. You can uh, assign custom permissions just by selecting something else other than the default. And the, the permission here in this square will actually change to, um, to custom. This is, um, again, a reminder that uh, the users are assigned roles while uh, published content will be assigned permissions. And uh, the difference between none and uh, denied permission is uh, that basically it's a hard or a soft deny. Uh, you can decide to leave someone um, without being denied just by uh, none permission. If, for example, you would like to um, give them permission in the future. So that's the blank in the red X then? Yes. The, the other the question may, that just came in earlier. Yeah, so you may may initially decide that you want to ban this person, but you still, if you don't, if you're not sure, you may just decide to leave this place blank. They won't be able to see anything, but you may want to come back to it later. And another tip I have here is also kind of um, covers uh, what Marcus has said, so I won't go into detail. But if you would like to assign permissions to a bigger team, let's say uh, multiple multiple employees within a company, you may want to assign them each uh, to a group and then assign permissions just once per uh, group level. So you, you don't have to do everything for every individual user. Yeah, that would be 
pretty short overview of the content of the blog. That's really useful. I, I like how you said uh, uh, users are given roles and what was it? users are given roles and content is given permission. So, uh, or yes. content is also, do you consider groups content then? Because groups can be given uh, permissions well, and the users are assigned I, a role or assigned to a group, right? Something like that. I, I guess there's a couple different the, ways. Yeah, I see the group more as like, this is a user group while uh, permission would be like permission to see the data or to see my workbooks or my projects. So I kind of think that the, the cheat is actually um, on, the, on the user level if you do groups. So. Okay, great. Really good, good documentation there. Thanks. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes typing it up like that helps reinforce how it works as well, so. That's why I wanted to do the whole blog on, on yeah. the full topic. Yeah, cool. All right. That's it, right? That's a lot. All right. Well done, guys. That's everybody, right? Yeah. That's it, yeah. All right. Well done. I'll see you guys on Monday. Have a good weekend. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, you too. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.